Hey, this is Matt Sorum from Velvet Revolver, The Cult, and Guns N' Roses. And you're listening to Your Morning Coffee with host Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchart. From Rolling Stone, Halsey claims label won't release new song unless they fake a viral moment on TikTok. From Billboard, for the record, how vinyl got its groove back to the tune of a billion dollars. And also from Billboard, pop rock and single songwriters, the state of the Billboard Hot 100's top 10 in Q1 2022. We've got this. We've got a lot of groovy mailbag stuff we're going to talk about. And yes, this is episode 94, not last week, even though we said last week temporarily was (laughs) episode 94. Apparently, I am number challenged. But yes, officially, this is episode 94. This is the Your Morning Coffee podcast. And here we are. Stand by for transmission. This is London calling. Wake up! The revolution is at hand! Your morning coffee is on the air. 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 Your Morning Coffee, the weekly music news for the new music business. It's the highly curated, agitated, advocated, moderated, and liberated digital music information that you need to know. We are your digital music authority. And now, from our studios in Hollywood, California, here's your hosts, Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchart. Oh, Jay, it is a long weekend. It is good to see you, my brother. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's uh, a little holiday weekend. We can uh, maybe sleep yeah. in a little bit. Yeah, right. No, and I'm I'm packing it in with with things. And as I mentioned to you before we started recording, I am sore. I helped my daughter move out of her apartment, <laughs> and <laughs> like you said, you know, you don't recover quite the same way that you used yeah. to when you do sort of uh, exercise like that. And, yeah, uh, I think our I NFL careers are just about over. <laughs> Yes. Going to have to hang up the cleats, Jay. Have, yep. to, have to hang up the cleats. Well, we've got so much to talk about today. And we sure do. I will just say one of the neat things is uh, when we, it, it's so gratifying to have folks respond back to us about articles. The best. And we, we had a ton from, from uh, the article we talked about that was actually in LA Magazine mm-hmm. about ticket prices. Um and yeah. it was just, uh, you know, it's it's nice to folks listening, listening to us, and it's so wonderful when they when we kind of touch a nerve, and and we learn so much from from other people's expertise. Yeah, uh, when they write in and 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 share things with us, and it's this kind of back and forth of information, and it's so fun, and that's what makes this podcast, yeah, for us. Absolutely a blast. Yeah, Dimitri Vitsa told me one time when I responded about a podcast that he did that that's, I forget exactly how he said it, but that's, you know, the greatest form of flattery is when someone responds um, and sends you a note about your podcast. And we're fortunate that we have, you know, such great listeners um, and we've received so many great comments. But this last week was kind of special. We can't tell you who made these comments because when I reached out to ask them if it was okay if we identified them, I haven't heard back yet. And just out of respect for that, but I will tell you there are a couple of, um, highly respected executives at the highest level. And uh, hopefully in the coming weeks, we can tell you who it was. But as Mike said, last week we talked about a story and the headline was an open letter to Paul McCartney regarding ticket prices. And we were a little disappointed that you c- couldn't get uh, an inexpensive seat at SoFi Stadium that seats like 70,000 people. And we kind of railed against that. But 
as is the case most times, you know, there's it's a little bit more complicated than than that. So I'm going to read a, a well. We'll both read some of the comments we received in our mailbag um, about that particular um, article and our uh, our reaction to it. Um, the first one was when ticket prices are below market demand for whatever reasons, the re- the resale platforms like StubHub reap the benefit. Tickets are flipped and then resold, and when that happens, the artist or neither the artist or the venue will get uh, any of that upsell. Right. And then someone else mentioned, he said, that's why dynamic pricing, a la airlines or hotels, is useful. It captures that demand and value or lowers price of ticket if less demand. Uh, and that margin primarily goes back to artist, not a broker or resale platform. And yeah. that was interesting. I, I, I had not thought that through. Actually. No, I wasn't aware of that. And uh, it was also mentioned that you know, uh, the ticketing companies have gotten very good at segmenting the market and pricing on a variety of factors that all, you know, meet and greets, aisle seats, platinum bundles, dynamic pricing. You know, it, it used to be that there were two or two or three price buckets. Now there's many. Right. And then <clears throat> someone else pointed out that in major markets like LA and New York, the pricing is out of control, but the amount of affluence and size of these markets drives the demand up. You can drive down to San, if you're in the LA air, in the LA market as Jay and I are, you can drive down to San Diego and ticket prices seem to be 30 to 40% less. Yeah. And artists can control some of this through the verification process via credit card, limit purchases to two tickets, you know, that sort of thing. But that becomes a tedious experience for the fan. Radiohead and Nine Inch Nails have done this where all tickets are at will call and you need to show your credit card to pick them up. But who wants to do that? Right. That's kind of a hassle. And then this this other person also said an area where the artist has more market pricing control is merch. Also, venues charge 16 to $18 a beer. I am all for making a profit, but this is a little ridiculous. Also, at SoFi, parking is tough. And for football is $100 plus. You can get a bargain across the street at the forum for $75 across the street at the forum. Wow. So yeah, gouge, gouge, gouge. And then I was going to share with you, I had an absolutely Please. miserable concert experience last week. So I did did, um, you know, when we were talking to, uh, when we interviewed Merc- Mercury Otis, yeah, we were chatting beforehand with Fran, his, um, his publicist, and she was talking about, she had just seen uh, Daryl Hall and Todd Rundgren together on the East Coast. She was based on the East Coast. And I had mentioned that I was bummed that that tour hadn't come to, to, the, to uh, the West Coast. And she said she had heard them talking backstage and that, in fact, that, that show was going to come out. So indeed it did. And I got tickets and that show was at the will turn, which I went a week, two weeks ago, I guess. Mm-hmm. And it was such a great experience. You know, it was packed. It was well sold. I don't, it wasn't quite sold out, but it was, you know, it was about an $80 ticket or so. And the will turn seats, I don't know, 1800, something like that. We had a seat, uh, you know, it wasn't great. There was some p- tall people in front of us as there always seemed to be, but you know, it was, it was a pretty darn good, concert experience the next week the next monday i went down to see lord huron at the house of blues in anaheim Mm -hmm. so i'd missed lord huron when they played at maybe the the nicest venue to see a show in southern california is the santa barbara bowl they had come through last summer couldn't make it for whatever reason and then this this time through um they did a a um a festival in redondo beach so they you know that kind of blacked out the the la area so i could either see them in anaheim at the house of blues or uh way north in kind of central california up in san Ynez. went down to the house of blues where i had been before and seen uh, the last show i saw there was uh we the kings back in 2016 i think been a while you know and, and it was a pretty good experience at, at we the kings and and it looked like at the time that it seated maybe 1500 and it, it was, i really liked the house of blues down there so i'm like okay let's let's see lord here on at the house of blues in anaheim i go down there i'm driving down again 85 dollar tickets or so and i'm pulling in i'm like this doesn't look the same and and i'm like i don't remember any of this in fact and it's right across the street from disneyland and you know is your if whenever you go to disneyland 
<laughs> you could just feel your wallet being sucked out of the out of your back pocket. You know, everything <laughs> starts getting expensive yeah, down there. Right. And and I and you you pull into the parking and there's this big VIP parking line. And when you when I bought tickets online, it said you know if you want the VIP experience for just this one show, maybe you know, send us a note and we could maybe give you some sort of an upgrade because it was stand, it was a, it was a general admission ticket only standing. So I sent, I said, okay, what, how, you know, and I sent it back. I'm interested. And they said, well, it, there's nothing at this time if in this VIP section. So I'm like, okay. So I go in and it's, it, it turns out that old house of blues is not there anymore. This is a brand new house of blues and it's twice as big uh and it was easily sold out maybe three thousand people it was I, I was asking different people who worked there how many people were in this venue and they and i got different wow. numbers but it's it yeah. appeared that it was completely sold out three thousand when you walk in there's a gigantic line and i'm like what's that line for and they said well that's for the vip upgrades and so i i so i asked people how well how much is that uh, that would be a hundred and fifty dollar upgrade to actually sit down per at person the, at the venue per person, <laughs> right? So they keep so House of Blues is is really pimping this VIP package that they it's an annual thing they want you to get. So they have all these screens around the on the inside of the venue showing these you know glitzy white people enjoying all the benefits and perks of this vip package and it was an absolute miserable concert experience yeah it's it's the grift you know it's the grift that happens and uh that's a 1500 dollars a year subscription they're they're trying to get you to to engage in and boy it was i mean first of all lord huron was great but it was an absolute yeah. horrible bad sight lines packed absolutely packed and then so you you could do the hundred and fifty dollar upgrade there to sit down, and then there was a woman walking around with a little iPad, and I saw people talking to her. So I walked over and I said, "What? What do you do?" And she said, "Well, you can upgrade to what do they call it? Premium standing. So you they would let you up in the balcony to stand. You couldn't sit, but you could stand, and that was an eighty dollar upgrade per ticket. I wonder how much of and that, if any, is shared with the artists." I don't. I'd love know. to see the That's, economics uh, of yes. that. Yes, but uh, so I was. Yeah. Oh boy, I was so disappointed, and it was an absolute god awful experience. And it's it, you know, there's not a single place to sit down, and it's all standing and concrete floors and oh yeah 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 yeah. It was really a drag. So packed in like the cow. grift. Yeah, yeah. Well, as, but the as, constant pressure to do this, you know, VIP package, and that's really right. what they're all about at the moment. Very disappointing. So, these are the things, Jay, that are going well, on in the world of concerts. as Henry Droz used to say, you know, God rest his soul. It's it's not about the money; it's about the money, right? There you go. And the man who uttered those prophetic words is none other than my good buddy Jay Gilbert. If you don't know him by now, you better because he's the co-founder of music marketing and strategy company Label Logic. He is the curator of the Your Morning Coffee newsletter and a former executive with Universal Music, Sony Music, Warner Music Groups, and Fox Home Entertainment. And this guy sitting across from me that I can see but you can't is uh, Mike Etchart, longtime host of Sound and Vision Radio, formerly of SST Records, Warner Music, Capital EMI, and Universal Music. And he's the guy that I would call to bail me out of jail. <laughs> uh oh, I better uh, get another credit card then because uh, I can see that going south. Very, By the way, very before we before we jump in, I just wanted to interject really quickly and give a shout out to Pitchfork. I mean, we we always watch what Pitchfork is is writing, but this we last do. week, holy cow, we featured three of their pieces in your morning coffee, and there were two uh, that were kind of in the second cup section. Um, so just a special shout out to, uh, pitchfork. The, the three that we featured, the first one was on discord, music fans become artists, besties, collaborators, and even unpaid interns. That was the first piece. The second one, mm -hmm. the woes of being addicted to streaming. And then the third one was inside the ambient music streaming boom. So those were the three that we featured from, from pitchfork. Um, some really, really great work uh, happening over at pitchfork. There are three of the five, actually, right? There's yeah. five total stories. That's right. So, yeah, they, they are on a roll. As they, I mean, they've always been on a roll. So, uh, yeah. great. And, you know, it's, it's, it is fun to see um, 
the, the you know just the the um, wonderful amount of information and stories that come out every week. I mean, the, obviously you feature in the newsletter, but it's just like it's just yeah. the golden age of information. It really is, and it's not just uh, the internet style of news. And what I mean by internet style is one person writes something and then 20 other people take that, make a story out of what somebody else wrote. The stuff from, you know, Variety Magazine is like world-class, you know, some of the things from Pitchfork and you and I read, of course, Music Business Worldwide and Hypebot mm-hmm. and Rolling Stone and, uh, and Billboard and all these great outlets. But, uh, they're doing the research, they're doing the interviews, and that's what makes it special for me. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, by the way, we should also mention our sponsors, Jace. We are sponsored oh. in part by HypeBot. Since 2004, HypeBot has chronicled the new music industry and the trends and technologies that are changing how music is discovered, consumed, marketed, and monetized. It is edited daily by founder Bruce Houghton with help from Alana Bonilla. HypeBot and sister blog Music Think Tank are published by live music discovery and marketing platform Bands in Town. Yes, Bands in Town. Over 65 million live music fans trust Bands in Town to get personalized concert alerts recommendations and messages from their favorite artists. It's the number one artist services platform connecting over 550,000 artists with their super fans. Managers, labels, agencies, and artists access their own dashboard to manage and promote their tour dates across all platforms. Also, sign up for the new Bands in Town artist community at community.artist.bandsintown.com. Love it, love it, love it. All right, there you Jay. Have it. Well, let's... Let's and we, we we kind of hinted about this at the beginning of the show. Oh boy, uh, we had a we had a Zoom call last week, uh, you and I and and uh, someone who who has listened to the show and he he mentioned on the on the Zoom he's like hey, I don't know if you guys noticed but you you were out of sequence with your numbers with your episode numbers, <laughs> which means <laughs> I was actually because I'm the one who does that and I'm like what <laughs> I went back as we're talking on the Zoom I'm like. Oh, yeah. It it went 92 90, to 94. 94. So episode right. 94 was actually 93, but we're, we're back on track. Yeah, this is 94. Yes, we're and back on You yeah. fix the website so, and we're all duh. good. So, yeah, all good. Count Jay. And then what can, what can I say? What can I say? Yeah. So anyway, let's jump into this story. And, you know, this, uh, you and I have kind of kidded over the years about sitting in marketing meetings and you know, having people say, well, I just, let's, I need a viral video here. We, we need to get a viral video going as if that's something you just snap your fingers and it happens. And and here yeah. is an article out of Rolling Stone magazine. The artist Halsey claims label won't release new song unless they fake a viral moment on TikTok. Yeah. And this was in pretty much every publication uh, in the music business this last week um, talked about uh, this particular story. Um, there was a really great piece in the LA times, which I'll, uh, refer to in a second. It had a great quote from Jonathan Daniel, uh, from crush music. Um, but this first one with Rolling Stone was written by Larisha Paul. And it says that the singer, uh, joined a growing collection of artists that are frustrated with their labels over the heightened role of virality in dictating music releases. And, you know, not all labels are like this, um, but there, you know, we talked about the A&R teams getting a little bit lazy and in some cases where they just didn't do the research that they used to do by going out and seeing bands and seeing the live show and the reaction and the lineup around the block that they were looking really more at things that were popping on TikTok. And there's some you know, there's some backlash there. And there's also some problems with it. If you're a new developing artist, some of these folks have never played a live show. They've never toured. They've never Mm -hmm. been in a a van. And so you can imagine some of the problems that that causes. But let's talk about this one in Rolling Stone about Halsey because she posted some videos online and they they were shared a lot. Um, It says, last week Halsey shared a TikTok it was actually more than one, from backstage at her tour rehearsals, suggesting she might start teasing new music. But it wasn't quite the tease that fans might have expected. Halsey claimed in a TikTok video that while the song and its accompanying music video have been complete for over a month, her label won't greenlight release unless they fake a viral moment on TikTok. And, you know, again, not all labels are like this, um, but there are... 
you know, those in, in the music industry is famous for this. You know, when something's popular, they replicate it. If Billie Eilish blows up, they look for other singers that sound just like Billie Eilish. And it's as old as the music industry. Yeah. She says, my record company is saying I can't release it unless they can fake a viral moment on TikTok. Everything is marketing. I just want to release music, man. And I deserve better TBA, TBH, to be honest. She said, I'm tired in the video. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it is, <clears throat> um, I mean, it's not surprising, I suppose. Um, you know, every every label, every marketing person that label wants something to hang their hat on, right? They want right. an event, something, you know, to to start marketing around. And I totally understand that, having been in that chair before. Yeah, um, yeah. But you know but, when 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 you use those when when you as soon as you insert the word fake as she is alleging that they have, um, that's when I think you're on kind of shaky ground, man. Yeah, and there's some people who think that this video of her complaining about this was a fake. Uh, marketing ploy. And she received a right. lot of heat for that. It says here, the TikTok video, which has reached over 7.7 .7 million viewers since being uploaded, has a comment section full of users certain that they've cracked the music business code, that the video of Halsey complaining about having to make TikToks for marketing is actually the TikTok they made for marketing. And then <laughs> there's this quote, bruh, I wish it was, the singer wrote in a response uh, to one comment, quote, they just said, I have to post TikToks. They didn't specifically say about what, so here I am. In another reply, she revealed that the request was for six posts on the viral video app. Now, I didn't see anything there that said, you know, uh, you need to make a fake uh, moment on this. What I'm reading here is that they asked her to make a half dozen TikTok videos, and yeah, there's nothing exactly. unusual, you know, uh, for an artist like that. And look, you go to where the party is. There's so many people mm -hmm. that are discovering music on TikTok. And by the way, she's on Capitol Records, which is part of Universal Music Group. And, you know, I don't see anything wrong with saying to artists, look, there's a lot of people on this platform. We'd like you to post X amount of times to try to reach that audience. It doesn't sound like they're telling her what to post. I don't know where this fake virality thing came from. No, exactly. But she says, <clears throat> she said, and, and this was something she posted on Twitter. She said, it's not about making the TikToks. I already make TikToks, she said on Twitter. They are saying if they don't reach some imaginary goalpost of views or virality, then they won't give me a release date at all. I'm not claiming to be oppressed, just saying that not ah. all marketing methods are universal. Yeah. Yeah. The singer's fans have asked Halsey to release the music anyway. You know, quote, I've been in this industry for eight years, she said, and I've sold over 165 million records. Still, the label owns the master, barring them from doing anything release wise without their explicit approval. I mean, you're not going to strong arm your label into withholding or putting something out. You know, you've made an agreement with them. And look, I'm not saying that you know, Halsey's wrong for complaining about this, you know, I'd be disappointed too. You know, when you're an artist and you have new music, it's like uh, being pregnant. You want to just get that baby out. It's been nine months, 10 months, 12 months, you know what I mean? For music, if I can use that analogy, mm -hmm. and you just want to get the music out there and share it with your fans. So I understand, you know, that she wants to get this music out, but you also have, this is a business. It's the music business. So, mm -hmm. you know, you need to kind of get all your planes flying in formation on the marketing side. Indeed. Uh, but as the article mentioned, though, she says Halsey is the latest, latest in a growing collection of artists who have increased their transparency about the heightened role of virality in dictating music releases. FKA Twigs recently reviewed and has since recently revealed, I should say, in a since deleted post that she had been told had been told off today for not making enough effort on the video sharing app, uh, promoting her latest album, Crash, uh, Charlie XCX joked yep. about her label, asking her to post her eighth TikTok of the week. Even Florence Welch captained a, captioned a video, the labeler begging me for low five TikToks, so here you go. Please send help. Um, <laughs> You know, but but this is again the you know, we talk about this a lot. You know, yeah. this is the challenge of being an artist. Now, it's not enough 
to make great music. Yeah, and it should be. You also have to. Yeah, and it. Yeah, and so I. As we've talked again, we we of course recognize that that is the reality of being an artist today. But boy, it's sure it's again the the amount of pressure on artists to you know to do this and do that and do it's it's just it's a lot. Right, it is really a lot. It's a complicated business now for that very reason you know you have to not only do facebook twitter instagram youtube those types of things but you have to look at these new platforms like tiktok and Mm -hmm. if there's a big audience there there's going to be more pressure for you to post there um i initially thought that maybe some of these labels were getting lazy and they wanted um halsey to do their work for them. And there was this video, uh, Rick Beato, uh, who I'm a big fan of put out kind of railing against lazy record companies. Uh, that's your job. Basically, you know, you're the one who's supposed to be doing the marketing, but as I read more about this, it doesn't sound as nefarious as maybe I thought it was initially. And asking an artist to be participating in a popular platform doesn't seem unreasonable to me, but the voice of reason I think came from that LA times piece I was telling you about. They uh, interviewed Jonathan Daniel, uh, co-founder of crush music. And that's, you know, the home of Lord green day, Miley Cyrus, Sia fallout boy. And he said, right now we have a, a Sia song and a panic at the disco song in the top 100 on Spotify, essentially because of TikTok. as the importance of terrestrial radio has faded, at least with, you know, uh, some younger listeners, the internet has democratized the hit making process. Daniel explains hits are no longer decided by industry gatekeepers, but by the masses on their iPhones, which has left labels desperate to repeat the trick when it happens. They're like, well, we're not sure what to do, but this is working for some people. So you should do it too. He says, <laughs> Daniel recalls being bummed out not long ago when he came across Tori Amos' first crack at the platform in which the beloved singer-songwriter greets the audience with a kind of get-me-out-of-here expression. Quote, it just felt like somebody had told her, you need to get on TikTok, the manager says of Amos, who broke out uh, in the early 1990s, long before the age of social media. And she's like, why are you making me do this? (laughs) I get it. I want to. Yeah, I get it, but I don't want to. Yeah, you know, and that's, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure artists throughout the history of the recorded music industry have been faced with newer, new marketing challenges along the way, but nothing to this extent. And yeah, yeah you know, you kind of, it's, I'm sure a lot of people are, are, especially established artists are kind of going in kicking and screaming saying, uh, really? Uh, this just doesn't feel right. Um, right. And it is, a lot of people perceive TikTok to be a, a younger platform and Adele uh, commented on this to Apple Music's Zane Lowe, uh, saying that she's happy, you know, to aim for older listeners, and that she's hardly worried younger younger people aren't aware of her. She said they're like, we've really got to make sure these fourteen year olds know who you are. Adele said, paraphrasing execs at her label, and I'm like, but they've all got moms. <laughs> oh excellent that's a good comeback yes indeed so well listen this is this is this is this will continue we'll i'm sure we'll be hearing various versions of this same story yeah which is you know this is this is just the reality for so many artists now it's like you 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 can't just you can't just be a good songwriter or a good performer right and read read underneath the headlines because some of these claim you know that the record labels are horrible and doing bad things and i'm not saying they are or there aren't but you know as ricky warwick sings there are three sides to every story yours mine and the truth absolutely absolutely well let's jump over to the next story jay this is from from billboard for the record how vinyl got its groove back to the tune of a billion dollars and and I will say again, as I have said on this show so many times, I never would have predicted this ever, no, ever. I don't ever. think you and I anybody. were both there. We were both there with yeah. with, with it going away, and um, and here we are again talking about it and unbelievable i mean yeah it's just unbelievable the numbers that we are talking about it's really impressive and this is from billboard it was written by robert levine um and it's a column uh, by robert levine analyzing news and trends in the music industry it's called for the record and of course now they're talking 
uh, literally about records, you know, Mm -hmm. and he says that, you know, for the past decade, the biggest story in the music industry has been vinyl's remarkable comeback fueled by, well, actually the business um, comeback fueled by uh, subscription streaming. At its 2014 low point, recorded music brought in just $6.7 billion in the U.S., according to the RIAA, less than half of its previous 1999 peak, right, of 14 almost $15 billion, um, and the new peak of $15 billion this last year. Uh, but for the most surprising story, maybe vinyl, which is growing much, much faster. At its low point in 2005, vinyl brought in just $14.2 million. Then it started growing to 88.9 million in 2010 to 243.8 million in 2014 then 419 million by 2018 i mean listen every year it's this crazy growth in 2020 vinyl accounted for 643 almost 644 million dollars or 5.3% of the recorded of the US recorded music business last year a billion dollars well, and then the number that caught my eye was 70 times as much as it was in 2005. Uh, and this article says it even brought in more revenue than Latin music in the U.S., although not internationally. Um, and as they say, science suggests it's growing fast. Um, I mean, these numbers are just unbelievable. And I will just keep saying, I mean, I just certainly... You know, I remember when the when the buzz started happening again and people talking about vinyl and vinyl and vinyl. And then you started seeing it at at outlets that like I remember seeing vinyl records at Whole Foods and, and <laughs> you know? Target and yeah. Yeah, it was and and then you started seeing lots of turntables. And then even the technology and you know you had this and we've talked about this a lot. You know, what's what's kind of what, what you don't think or what most people don't think about is, you know, the First of all, the process of, of making vinyl is very complex, and the, yeah. the vinyl has some I- inherent limitations about when you when, how much music you can put on it, and yeah, and, while keeping you know, the, the fidelity, the, 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 right? Yeah, exactly. And the songs, and, and so it, it it is kind of a it has always been kind of a dark art. You know, there are people, mastering engineers, that were able to kind of coax more bass, coax better fidelity, and things like that. And then, but all of that brain trust, the people that understood that process and really knew it, they were pushed out in 1990. You know, out of the business, and a lot of and them. so yeah. a lot of them. So you've got this this kind of resurgence coming, but it's you can't really overstate how. You know, it's been for a lot of people just kind of this relearning the business on how that process works from right. the manufacturing side, the marketing, or the, the the mastering side, and you know all of these backlogs, and of course, petroleum crisis have prices have gone up. The price right. of vinyl is so much more than it ever was. Yeah. So there's just so many different components and factors in yeah. in this resurgence that, Fa- that yeah, were, uh, that's remarkable. Vinyl is a, a different configuration than it was. Now it's a premium configuration. And yep. uh, people are paying a lot more attention to the details and to the quality. And it's, you know, it's 180 gram vinyl in a lot of uh, uh, circumstances. Yesterday I bought um, the latest Tears for Fears album on vinyl. And it came with a seven inch with a couple of extra songs, which was cool. And if you, if you haven't heard Tears for Fears, uh, Tipping Point, um, do yourself a favor. It's such an amazing, amazing album. Um, but the experience of vinyl for me, well, let me back up. You know, during the lockdown, um, I decided one of the things I wanted to do was replace some of my favorite albums on vinyl that I have, but they're pretty banged up and they've been played a bunch and maybe they don't sound that good or whatever. <clears throat> some of them I even bought used maybe. So I bought new copies of some of my favorite albums and it was a lot of fun, you know, like a treasure hunt trying to find them first of all. And then, you know, with all the problems that you talked about with the supply chain, it was really challenging, but I started getting those and I realized that the act of playing a vinyl record, there's something very romantic about that. And it takes me Mm -hmm. back to when I worked at tower records that you have to be present. You don't just put it on like a playlist and then go about your day because you know, it's what 22 minutes per side or whatever it is. And you're going to have to flip that thing and lift the needle up. If you don't have an automatic uh, turntable that way. And it just, 
you enjoy the music a little bit differently. I'm not saying it's better or worse. It's just a different experience. And I found myself going back to reading, you know, like with the Tears for Fears, they have the lyrics, which is so great. Some of my favorite albums, you know, Elton John, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, it, you know, it had the lyrics in there and it, it brings you into the music faster you know, the accidentals vessel, you've got the lyrics right there. You're, you're already into it and singing along. Right. And with this tears for fears as a photographer, I was blown away at the photographs in the packaging. It's a gatefold. So you open it up and it's one amazing photograph. And I just, I miss those days. Um, I, I saw this, this thing online and I, I, I can send it to you. It's really funny. It shows, like an iTunes back when downloads were a thing, it shows an iTunes screen of, you know, and it looks like a spreadsheet basically of your music. And then it showed kiss alive Two opened up with that gatefold of all the, you know, flames and bombs going yeah. off and all that stuff. And it really hit home the point that we were really losing that big visual aspect of music. Absolutely. And I, and, and one of the things that I kind of thought about early on was you know, is this just me and my demographic reliving those moments? Um, but then seeing my ki- seeing my kids have different reactions to to vinyl, which which was kind of again surprising to me because I thought it was just you know how could how could how could a young person kind of really enjoy the same thing? And and as you said, it's it the difference is it's not passive music listening, it's active music listening. And there's a big difference, a big difference. And, you know, you're not putting something on, on Spotify and then cleaning the kitchen. You know, yeah, you're, exactly. you, you, you are, you are sitting down and, and proactively listening to music and it, it is a very different experience. And, yeah. and um, yeah, so, but this article we were talking about is, is um, at the music biz conference where you were um, music watch founder, Russ Krupnik presented a new consumer research study on the topic. And the, that, that uh, study is called revelations about the vinyl revolution, talking about where this growth is coming from and why, as as well as how the business might expand, and this music, this study was funded by the Music Business Association and the RAAA. Yeah. So they did. You know, they they reached out to fourteen hundred consumers, um, including more than nine hundred vinyl buyers. And the report segments the market of vinyl buyers according to how long they've been collecting: thirty eight percent more than a decade, thirty percent between three and ten years, and about a third less than two years. And how often and why they buy. And what's fascinating, as the article says, although we tend to think of vinyl buyers as a particular tribe, there are more of them than people realize. 17.6 million of them, in fact, in the U.S. That's more than a third of the number of Americans who bought tracks as downloads at the peak of that market. Wow. And as the article says, although 26% are veteran and committed, that would be you, Jay. That would be me. Uh, there, are also con- <laughs> there, are, there are also consumers who focus more on the packaging, which is 26%, and artists, 20%, as well as pop fans, 12%, and new occasionals, occasional buyers, I suppose. 15%. I like that. It sounds like the name of a band. Like, where, where did you go last night? Oh, I went to see the new occasionals, and they were, they were That's awesome. That's right. And, I do want to interject the opening act was veteran really and committed. quickly, or sorry, uh, about this, because I, I find this all very fascinating. Our, our friend Will Page um, mentioned in an interview that the stat was something like half the vinyl purchased is not played. And I don't know, you know, where that came from, but I do know that people, you know, will buy vinyl and frame it and put them, put it up on their wall. Um, They'll buy it at the merch table as a souvenir from a show to, you know, or get it signed. And typically vinyl, well, it used to come with a download card Um, that used to be very Mm -hmm. common, but I noticed the last few albums that I bought did not come uh, with that download card. Um, but I find that really interesting. Maybe half isn't actually played. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, and, and, and that's, and that's the hip factor, right? So I think there's always been, you know, trend wise, there's always been people that want to jump on the bandwagon and be, pers- they want themselves to be perceived as cool and hip. And so what's cooler now, Jay, than showing off your vinyl collection when people come over to your pad, um, <laughs> you know, it's bragging rights. But one of the things that I found really interesting, so, um, is, you know, it's kind of the demographics, um, 
the, this this person who wrote the article said, for most of the time, I've been collecting vinyl, many, but not cer- but certainly not all. Buyers look like me, <laughs> pale male, and the kind of person <laughs> who enjoys flipping through old records at a garage sale. That's me. But he said that's changing. Vinyl consumers are forty six percent female. 20% people of color and evenly balanced between those over and under 35, according to the Music Watch report, which I found that as very interesting uh, numbers. And and 46% female kind of knocked me out. Because, yeah. again, you kind of think of this as sort of a geek male thing, or yeah. I do. Anyway. Well, if you've ever seen the movie uh, High Fidelity, no, no. that's kind of the oh, stereotype yes, I that I, I think about. And I think that they're kind of dispelling here, you know, and, mm-hmm. and as he as he says in the article, you know, a hobby known for devotion to the obscure may have mainstream taste. You know, the best selling records of 2021 include albums by Olivia Rodrigo, Taylor Swift, Billie Eilish, as well as Prince and the Beatles. Yes, exactly. So again, there's there's big, big sellers. Of course, it's still fun to find those obscure artists that you're looking for. Um but no, it's it is um, you know it, it's it's across the board, and that's I think that's the most gratifying thing that I pulled out of this article was yeah it is really a broad demographic of people that are interested in it that yeah. are buying it consuming it and it's kind of certainly the the there are the diehards that have always been there the, yeah. the pale male folks (laughs) pale male perhaps occasionally i I resemble that remark um but but um you know it is it is a growing uh, it's it's a growing demographic and the market just seemingly continues to go up and up and up and i mean i just i'm just knocked out again i i never in a million years would have predicted this you know one of the things that's really helped that that it's here yeah one of the things that's really helped vinyl is record store day you know, uh, mm-hmm. Michael Kurtz and his team over at Record Store Day have done this fantastic job of having multiple drops and multiple Record Store Day celebrations. And the labels participate with exclusivity on certain things. And, you know, we've participated, too. And just it's been such a joy to see people going back to record stores. Uh, super, super cool piece. Very encouraging. And we'll watch the this vinyl thing keep growing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Our last article, Jay, by the way, is uh, another Billboard article. Um, Pop rock and single songwriters, the state of the Billboard Hot 100's top 10 in Q1 2022. There's a lot of lot of numbers there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, let me pop there up are, that you know, there's, article. What they do is they have three takeaways um, that we'll go through. So we're, we won't go through the whole report. But, you know, they ask, what were some of the most notable trends on the Billboard Hot 100 songs chart for the first quarter of 2022? Well, there's this hit songs deconstructed. Um, It's a a report. It provides analytics for top 10 Hot 100 hits. And it's released its state of the Hot 100 top 10 Q 2022 report. There we go. So, right. um, And and I want to go through these, these three. Um, I'll let you take one and three, and I'll take number two about what are the three takeaways from Hit Songs Deconstructed's latest in depth research. And by the way, we should mention if you haven't visited, and I haven't gone there in depth I, uh, myself, but Hit Songs Deconstructed is a website and it's a subscription service. And it's a really interesting, man, it's, I mean, they, they, completely analyze songs yeah, and like cool. the song structure and the and the sonics and so it's a combination of this kind of data of how c- songs are um, how, are created and kind of what has made them successful and a hit and and so you can kind of you can subscribe and get that data but you can also subscribe and learn how to to format your songs to better fit it's kind of depressing actually too, when you think about it it's like okay these songs are hits and they have these elements yeah. and if you're writing a song you can you can add you can massage them to be more like it's like wow it's super but interesting it's, it's a it's super interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. It is super interesting. And I, so, I, I misspoke in, earlier. It's you're absolutely right. You know, hit songs deconstructed, you know, that's that's the site. The report is the state of the hot one hundred top ten Q one twenty twenty two. But let's let's dig in on what hit songs deconstructed says, you know, are the three takeaways from the report. Exactly. So of course, no surprise here, pop continues atop hip hop. 
as if you uh, to to uh, to make the the rhyming scheme happen. It says in the first three months of 2022, pop was the most common primary genre in the Hot 100's mm. top ten, contributing to 47 percent of all top ten hits. Hip hop ranked second at 24 percent. So pop's dominance continued, though somewhat diminished from Q4 of 2021 when it far outpaced hip hop 54 percent to 14 percent. That four quarter surge. Me. Me too, me too. Uh, they said that fourth quarter surge helped pop claim the biggest share among Hot 100 top 10s over hip hop for all of 2021, 39% to 30 to 20, I'm sorry, 39% to 34%. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that was really, really surprising uh, to me. Um, but the, the second one that they talk about, t- the second takeaway is rock rising. Rock as a primary genre claimed 12% share of Hot 100 top 10s in Q1 2022. And again, that was another surprise. Its highest level of prominence since way back in Q3 of 2016 notes this uh, hit songs deconstructed. Rock is up from 5% showing in Q4 of 2021, following 7% in Q3 2021, 4% 4% in Q2 2021 and a shutout in Q1 2021. And they, they note that Gale's ABCDEFU helped spark rock success in the first quarter of this year, hitting number three on the Hot 100 in March, along with Imagine Dragon and uh, JID's Enemy, which reached the region the same month on its way to a number five peak in April. So that's takeaway number two. Yeah. And this next one, you know, you and I have talked a lot about the difference from when we got in the business to now. Um, You're seeing this sort of specialization in the process of songwriting. And it's, you know, it's... It, well, it's just kind of the way, like like everything, you know. It's whether it's sports or things in in business, you you see so much specialization and 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 um, right, kind of. A, it's just it's just changed the way songs are done. So this this particular takeaway is writers cramped, <laughs> but less so at number one. It says among uh, the Hot 100 top tens in Q1 of 2022, songwriting team sizes of five or more continue to be the most popular, while writers who go it alone continue to be scarce, absor- uh, observed this this website, Hit Songs Deconstructed. In that span, 41% of the top tens featured five or more credited songwriters. Top tens by one and three writers shared second place at 18%, followed by writing teams of two and four, each at 12%. So writing groups of five or more also led for all of 2021, claiming 56% of all yeah. hot 100 top 10. And we had touched on this a few weeks back that we had read that the average number of co-writes across the hot 100 that given week was like four and a half was the average. And, yeah. and I read this thing. I think this is correct that Gail's ABCDEFU had like eight or nine writers on it. It's unreal, you know, and and one thing I don't know, and maybe you have visibility on this, is like, what what is that conversation like in the recording studio? You know, did, did, did you stop and say, okay, we're all writing this together, or this is my idea and I'm getting 50% and you guys get whatever's left? You know, how does that conversation happen in the studio? Or does it happen before well, the studio? I've heard stories of, you know, the guy who delivered the weed getting credit on... <laughs> on a song. Yeah, yeah. But I think it happens a couple of ways. When you're a band, um, sometimes you, I think Van Halen did this, um, where they just put all four on, on, yes. on everything, right? So they all participated in that publishing. And I think... And that was an agreement at the beginning of the yeah, bands, typically. Yeah, REM I, was the same way. U2 was the same way, or is the same way. Yeah, and I think there are obvious um, duos like Lennon McCartney, who clearly... Mm-hmm there were songs that weren't written by both of them. Um, but they had this, this agreement. I think what this is from what I'm hearing is that they'll go into a studio with today. It's a little bit different. Um, there are two types of ways that, well, there's many types, but two that I'm going to talk about. One is where they have one person who's really a specialist when it comes to hooks, one who's really a specialist on choruses and, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe one that's really good at, 
you know, um, guiding the entire ship or with intros and outros. So it's to your point, it's become much more specialized, but there still are singer songwriters out there doing it the old school way. And, you know, I was telling you that I recently met with uh, Brett James in his office in, in Nashville. His office is a house on Music Row, and he's a professional songwriter. He's written 500 songs for other artists. Uh, I think he's got close to 30 number one hits. But what those people do um, in that Nashville songwriting circuit is they work, and they work hard, and they collaborate, and they co-write, and they get to work every day, and they write. And it's typically, you know, a couple of people in a room. Uh, maybe three. And, and does it get bigger sometimes? Yeah, it has, you know, they've, they write in larger groups sometimes, <clears throat> but I think on the pop side, when you've got like eight or nine writers, that seems to me more. And Rick Beato talks about this on one of his videos. There's more of this machine. And mm-hmm. a lot of people don't like that because they feel like it takes the heart and soul out of the song and becomes more of uh, just trickery to, game the algorithm or to game favor. And I always wonder too, let's say there's a song with five songwriters. Are they all in for 20% or is that even, that's something we we could never see, but that's something. Well, I've seen some of it um, with some of our artists, not five songwriters, but I can tell you that typically uh, publishing splits are split evenly, but I've seen many, many cases on like, say two people writing a song where one person got 80% of the right. You've heard the old joke, right? Change a word, get a third. (laughs) (laughs) I want to be that guy that gets the third. Mailbox money. Mailbox money. Exactly. Well, it is, uh, and maybe we'll have someone uh, that listens in that that is involved in publishing and songwriting that can kind of reach out to us and say, you know, how did, how does that, you know, go? And and I know like, especially in Nashville, you know, you've, you've got people, you've got established publishing companies kind of connecting people, you know, like, like, you know, and do that. So, so I can see in that scenario where, where those things are determined up front, you know, that, yeah, this is a 50, 50, or this is a 30, 30, 33, 33, 33 or whatever. Yeah. But I, 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 re, I wonder, because I've been in recording studios when you've got lots of people sitting around and, and suddenly the guitar player who maybe is just there to play on the session will throw out an idea or a, a suggestion for something, you know, and, and I, but I don't know. How, I just don't know how, how it works on the backside, you know, or if, if or he just gets dazed out. I, I don't know. You know sure. It's, or it's, what about the producer or engineer who's helping to craft those songs? A lot of producers yes. now are in on the, the songwriting and mm-hmm. some of them are, are, you know, artists in their own right. So fantastic uh, piece to uh, to dig into, you know, from Hit Songs Deconstructed. The article was written by Gary Trust over at Billboard. Really interesting. Yeah. And check out the website. It is a fascinating website. So, boy. All right. Well, Jay, you know, it's a three-day weekend, so we're going to wrap up this episode, which is truly episode number 94, even though, as I mentioned last <laughs> week, I said that was episode 94. Are you Don't sure? listen to me then. Listen to okay. me now. All I'm right. totally sure. <laughs> so, But I uh, want to thank our wonderful, groovy folks that help us put this episode on. Uh, good friends over at Hypod and Bands in Town. Yeah, Big thanks thank for you guys. That. And of course, thanks for everyone that listens to the podcast and everyone that checks out Jay's wonderful newsletter, the Your Morning Coffee newsletter. If you don't subscribe, you better subscribe because it is Jay does the homework for he's that kid that you want to sit next to in in school that (laughs) already did his homework. And you know, he's going to ace the test. You want to sit next to Jay in, in, in high school if you ever go back. So check out the, of course, make sure you subscribe. Thanks for listening in. And folks, we'll be back next week with episode 95 of the Your Morning Coffee podcast. And we will see you then. You've been listening to Your Morning Coffee, the weekly music news program for the new music business. Join Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchard next time for the digital music news you need to know.